Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that Black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Hello and good afternoon. If this is your first BWHI event, welcome and thank you for your partnership in advancing the health and wellness of Black women. If this is not your first event, welcome and thank you for your continued partnership. My name is Erica Reeves. I'm joining you from Columbus, Ohio, and I've had the pleasure of serving on the board of BWHI since May of 2020. And I also serve as the chair of our policy committee. On behalf of my fellow board members, I wanna welcome you to today's webinar, The Path to Perinatal Wellness, and thank you for joining us um, in, in a conversation that advances BWHI's mission around education, inspiration, and timely programming, and a special thanks to the staff for developing and executing excellent programming throughout the year on various topics, again, that advance the health and wellness of Black women. BWHI, for those who don't know, it is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing health equity and social justice for Black women across the lifespan through policy, advocacy, social justice, education, research, and leadership development. The organization identifies the most pressing health issues that affect the nation's 22 million Black women and girls. As a mission and vision-driven organization, BWHI invests in the best of the best evidence-based strategies and champions community engagement at every stage. Events like this one are part of that community engagement approach. As you know, we are here today to hear from invited guests about their work and lived experiences related to perinatal wellness with a focus on mental wellness. BWHI aims to educate individuals, families, policymakers, providers, and others on maternal mental health and related health disparities impacting the Black community. We intend to cover how the maternal mental health experiences of Black birthing people differ with layered stressors of racism, sexism, and cultural insensitivity. It is our hope that this webinar will demystify perinatal mental health and mood disorders, examine why Black birthing people are falling through the cracks for screening and care, and illuminate the path to wellness. With that, thank you for joining today's webinar. And I will turn it over to today's moderator, Adriana Hopkins, who is an anchor and reporter with ABC7 WJLA. Thank you so much. And Adriana, thanks. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reeves, for the wonderful introduction. And as always, thank you to the Black Women's Health Imperative for inviting me to host another informative and timely event. Uh, as you heard Dr. Reeves say, my name is Adriana Hopkins. I'm an anchor at 7 News DC, the ABC affiliate here in Washington, DC. And I recently accepted an adjunct professor role with Florida International University, launching their DC News Bureau. In addition to my jobs, I have another job. I'm a mom of two, a two-year-old daughter, an eight-month-old son, and both of those pregnancies were high risk. They were life-changing. The birth of my son was traumatic to the point where the hospital sent me an apology letter for what I endured. I say all of this to say that while pregnancy and childbirth and new life, it's exciting, it's wonderful, it's a blessing, it takes a toll on your mental health and mental health is overlooked in general. We know that mental health experts have long said it's been the silent pandemic before this coronavirus pandemic. If it's overlooked in general, we know what that means for minority groups, specifically black women, it is ignored altogether. 
I am very happy to be part of this event, exploring mental health, and of course, diving into the path of mental wellness. So this afternoon, we'll hear from a group of experts offering invaluable insight into this topic. Jen Davis is the state chapters manager for Postpartum Support International. And in her role, she helps new chapters form and existing chapters continue to elevate perinatal mental health in their states. And she's also the mother of a nine-year-old daughter, a two-year-old son, and she's had her own experience with postpartum anxiety and depression. Lakia Williams is a licensed therapist instilling hope and resilience through treatment. That is the hallmark of her work. She's also a mother of two and calls it a privilege to provide therapy and case management to a diverse group of individuals. Jimmy Bonds is a D.C. native. He is a father of two. He is a managing partner at the online radio station, Philadelphia Radio, and he hosts the Jimmy Bonds podcast. He is a dream chaser and executor. Karen Sheffield Abdullah is a nurse scientist whose interests focus on the utilization of holistic, integrative, multi sector strategies to promote physical, mental, and emotional well being for individuals and communities. She is interested in developing strategies to reduce the long term health effects of psychological trauma, anxiety, and depression on women's health and birth outcomes. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Kanika Harris. Now she serves as the Director of Maternal Health for the BWHI, the Black Women's Health Imperative. She is a behavioral health scientist with a special focus on health equity, maternal health, and women's health. She is a mother of three, a near-miss survivor, a doula, and birth justice advocate, and she also serves as the Maternal Health Equity Advisor for the State of Maryland and the Public Health Expert for the Lactation Commission in Washington, D.C. Also, be on the lookout for her upcoming documentary. It's called Listen to Me, and it explores and follows four women at the front lines of the Black maternal health movement. And we recently heard from Dr. Erica Reeves. She is the founder and the CEO of Equity for the Health of It, LLC, and a Black Women's Health Imperative board member and policy committee chair. For more than a decade, her career has focused on expanding access to long-term services and supports and addressing the structural drivers of health inequities. She says she is a social entrepreneur at heart. So as you can see here, the experts you're gonna hear from are very impressive. I am very much looking forward to hearing their insight as we unpack and dive into this topic of perinatal mental health and wellness. I do want to encourage everyone joining us here today to uh, leave your comments and your questions in Facebook Live and YouTube in the comment section, and we'll address those questions at the end of our program. I want to turn now to Jen Davis, the State Chapters Manager for Postpartum Support International, to discuss the facts and the myths surrounding maternal mental health. Excited to hear from you today, Jen. Thank you so much, Adriana, and so happy to be here with you all this afternoon. So let's just dive right in. When we say maternal mental health, what are we talking about? And maternal mental health refers to a woman's mental health during pregnancy and the postpartum period. And you'll often hear the terms maternal and perinatal used interchangeably when we're talking about a mother's mental health. Um, the maternal mental health disorders typically occur during the perinatal period. So that's the prenatal period which is during the pregnancy and the postpartum period, which is considered the year um, up to a year after a child is born. When we're thinking about maternal health disorders, and sometimes they're referred to as perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or PMADs, we're talking about depression, we're talking about anxiety, we're talking about obsessive compulsive disorder, birth-related PTSD, bipolar disorder, and postpartum psychosis. But the most common are depression and anxiety disorders. Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are the number one complication of pregnancy and childbirth. So we find that one out of seven women experience PMAD and less than 15% of those women are actually getting treated. And if we get even more specific, half of the women that are diagnosed with uh, postpartum depression are not treated. And there is a clear economic burden when we think mm -hmm. about PMADs that are going untreated. Actually, it's up to 14 billion dollars when we look at all the births in 2017. So this is clearly a silent health crisis and it doesn't only affect moms, it affects the whole family. It can have an effect in the workplace as well. 
You know, it's one of these situations I find so confounding that when you break down the statistics, you know, you say one in seven, that's a lot of people. I mean, yes. I have more than seven friends and I can say if one out of every group of seven people, that is a lot of people. But why is it a silent pandemic? Why are people suffering in silence with their mental health issues after having a baby? So, so often we're not talking about it. So often screenings are happening. And if we take it to another level and think about Black women, we're mm -hmm. experiencing um, maternal mental health disorders at an even higher rate than the population. And most times this is going unreported and mm -hmm. symptoms are not being addressed. So close to 40% of Black mothers are going to suffer from postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And that's more than double the rate of the general population, which is around 15%. And there are a number of factors that contribute to, to this. And this was mentioned earlier, systemic racism, socioeconomic status. There's a, a lack of high quality medical care. Um, black women are at higher risk of complications. Sometimes there's financial barriers, increased stress or trauma. All of these reasons, all of these factors contribute to why we're experiencing it at a higher rate. But also, again, we're less likely Likely to seek treatment and we're less likely to receive treatment. And sometimes that's because of a distrust in the healthcare system, um, lack of diversity in healthcare, and then again, less screening that is happening. So I also, and you mentioned this, and I feel like um, you experienced this as well. Both of my children, I had anxiety and depression. I did not tell anyone. My husband did not even know I went through this until I started working at postpartum support because, you know, it's almost the strong black woman syndrome. Mm -hmm. I can just navigate this. I can figure it out. I also don't want to be a burden on anyone. So, and, and I had one of my children right after, right before the pandemic hit. So life has been crazy since then. And it's just, you know, you just feel like you can navigate it. And also, because we don't talk about this often in the Black community, it wasn't something that I talked about with my mother. I didn't know family members who went through it. Mm -hmm. So we just feel like we can navigate this. Um, and, and often in the Black community, when we feel like we need support, you know, we lean to family or we lean to religious leaders or friends. Mm -hmm. We don't always go seek professional um, support when it's needed. And sometimes that's just a distrust in the healthcare system, um, experiences with inaccurate diagnosis or right. just racial discrimination. So all of that kind of contributes to it. And what we want to really push is universal screening. So we want to mm -hmm. make sure mm -hmm. that during pregnancy and during postpartum, all women are receiving comprehensive screening. That screening mm -hmm. is being evaluated and we're creating treatment plans based on what these mothers need. And sometimes that's group support, individuals, mm -hmm. sometimes this medication is going to have to be tailored to the needs of, of specific mothers. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a lot, especially the strong Black woman syndrome. And it reminds me of that meme of a woman who is drowning and she has her hand up for help and someone high fives her like, good job. You got it. And right. then she They're goes like, under. It. And then she goes yeah, under. All good. You can handle it. <laughs> so and like, I definitely good. think that Black women take on everything and it just becomes a burden. The other thing I always find very interesting just in the way that mental health is looked at universally and especially in the black community is we've done a really good job of separating our physical illness from our mental illness and health. Uh, for instance, you go through pregnancy and everyone knows the physical changes that your body will endure. And we've been able to just accept that and, and not talk about well, if your body's going through all of this, you know, your hormonal changes, your physical changes, obviously you would think that your mind is going through this as well. Yeah. We don't talk about it with our family. It's not something that we're open about, especially in the black community. There's a lot of, you know, pray about it, go to church. Yes. Uh, you need Jesus. On the provider side, you talk about universal screenings. What are the questions you want doctors to be asking their patients specifically women of color. 
So I think it's a it's a mix, not only about what questions are we asking, because there are tools, there are tools that we can use, Edinburgh, there are tools out there, but it's it's being comprehensive about it. It's making sure that it's not just happening one time. So it can't just be during a pregnancy, um, during a pregnancy visit that we're asking these questions, probing about how you're feeling. If you're feeling, you know, the level of stress that you're going through, what's contributing, how often are you having these feelings? But this needs to be something that we're asking consistently, even after the baby is born. And it has to be comprehensive. And and we as, as Black women, you know, I know I didn't do this enough. We have to push when we're feeling, when something is feeling off and we're feeling like, mm, this isn't right. This is something that we have to bring to our healthcare providers as well. And we have to push them. We, we, we have to, we have to advocate for ourselves. Um, on top of that, there's so much training that needs to happen for our healthcare providers. So they're equipped around perinatal mood and anxiety disorders in order to ask the right questions. Um, so I think it's a mix of all of that. But you mentioned something like in the Black community, we are we are less likely than any other racial or ethnic group to receive treatment for mental health. Um, so I think amongst our community, we have to be more comfortable having these conversations. We mm -hmm. have to be more comfortable advocating for ourselves. Um, and when we're not receiving the right treatment from a healthcare provider, we have to be comfortable moving on to a provider that's going to give us exactly what we need. Because if we do not push for it, we're not going to just receive it. And that's unfortunate, but that's just the reality of it. Yeah, you have to advocate for yourself. It's one of the things I tell everyone, if you're not advocating for yourself, you need to hire a doula or someone else who can advocate on your behalf, hire that Absolutely. friend, uh, bring that friend in who can advocate for you if you're nervous about speaking up, um, because really you're your best advocate. And you also mention if you don't like your provider, I say all the time, it's like going to the hair salon. If someone messes up your hair, you're not going back. It's Absolutely. your money, it's your time, it's your body. So you need to find someone that you trust. And it really does have um, a collaborative relationship with you in your mental and physical care. I want to allow Dr. Uh, Sheffield Abdullah to come in here real quick and just kind of offer some insight. I'm going to ask you the same question. You know, what what is it that you would like providers to be asking their patients, even when they come trotting in happy with that newborn glow, you know, we're so good at hiding everything in our real emotions. What are the questions you want providers to be asking their patients? So thank you so much. I really, you know, as you were talking about it, I, there was so much that was coming to mind for me, and I'm so happy that you included providers. So in addition to physicians, I'm also a nurse midwife. I've been a nurse midwife for 16 years. So as we think about women's health care providers and the knowledge that they need to have when providing care to women, especially women of color, Black women, what are the conversations that we need to be navigating across the prenatal course as well as during the postpartum period? And in a study that I've done during my dissertation work, I asked that specific question. Are you having conversations with your healthcare providers surrounding stress and your psychological distress, meaning um, anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms? And you might recognize or guess that the answer was no. They are not navigating or having these conversations. And mm -hmm. I would say that we need to be educating the healthcare providers to figure out how to navigate this conversation so that it is woven throughout mm -hmm. the continuity of care across different providers that that person may be seeing throughout their pregnancy and being able to navigate the ways in which the unique ways that women, Black women in particular, talk about stress and anxiety mm -hmm. because it may not be the traditional way that white women talk about it. Mm -hmm. So really recognizing and understanding those unique stressors that are present and understanding the ways in which we might be able to elucidate or elicit those questions and doing it in a way where it is trustworthy mm -hmm. and that if women are vulnerable, especially black women, as we talk about strong black women or superwomen, mm -hmm. uh, which was a conceptual framework that guided my work, as we think about black women who are becoming vulnerable to be able to express whether or not they're experiencing anxiety or depressive symptoms, that there is something that you will do to help them. Yeah. Not yeah. That they're doing that, and then there's, they're left in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So they want to know that there are resources that they can mm -hmm. then go to that mm -hmm. are going to be reputable, that mm -hmm. are going to understand their needs, that mm -hmm. it's going to be timely, 
-hmm. right? That there, the problem with mental health care is that either you're so acute that we want to go ahead and send you to the ER, or you're yeah. not that acute, and it's three months to the to, to the time that we can get you in with a mental health care provider, and that's the gap that we need to be narrowing. And so I'll stop there, but I really um, just wanted to contribute that little piece there as you were talking about that. No, that was perfect. You bring up so many um, points that just resonated with me, the continuity of care mm -hmm. and the understanding and having the diversity training to know that Black women may speak or express differently than your community if mm -hmm. you're not a provider of color. And that's key because the three of us could talk and know exactly what we mean. Yeah. And then I could go speak with someone else. And if I'm not code switching, we're on two different pages. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Dr. Sheffield Abdullah, I'm gonna put you on hold. Jen, thank you so much. We're gonna circle back to you. I wanna bring in uh, right now, Lakia Williams and Jimmy Bonds to share their experiences with maternal mental health. Um, thank you both for being here and you know, it's one of these things where maternal mental health affects the entire family and how the family can function. So Lakia, let's start with you. Um, and if you don't mind sharing your, your story. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I'm a mother of two children. Um, I had traumatic births with both of my children. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the experiences, rather one of the things that um, that completely surrounded me in both of those experiences was that this can't happen again. So to be a part of this conversation and, and, and um, bringing forth this awareness is such a big part of my healing trajectory and I'm grateful to be here, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I know it's tough and I wanna thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your story. And as someone who also had a traumatic birth, my son is eight months old and it's still like I can be on the brink of tears at times. So I know how hard this is. So I just want to thank you um, for being here. Jimmy, if you don't mind chiming in and sharing sharing your experience with mental health. You know, being the partner in this situation, um, it was tough because you had to sit back and kind of watch um, you know, a, a being a male, I'm not familiar with having a child, of course, but, um, you know, having to just be the support system and not, not really be able to do anything, um, was a very tough thing to sit back and, and have to, have to see, um, both, both our, both pregnancies were tough. Uh, both pregnancies were, um, traumatic in a sense and both of them really you know it, it exuded and it showed how our how not just in our personal experiences but how many women in, in a lot of these situations are really catered to um and it also showed that um it, it showed that there was a lack of a lack of care in so many areas um and that was one of the one of the things i really that highlighted really th through our birthing experience Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lakia, I want to ask you when, you know, after your birth with your children, um, did you have the wherewithal to identify I'm experiencing a mental health problem? I need help. Or were you someone who's like, this is just a part of postpartum life. I'll deal with it. So definitely I was at a very complex in, in, intersection, right? Having just um, graduated from my master's program in clinical counseling. So I was highly aware that I was experiencing um, a mental health crisis, but okay. also um, operating from that uh, black and female space of these, this is, this is an experience that I kind of have to shoulder. Like it's just a part of, of what's what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. even with the privilege of having education and being in the field, um, I was still at that point as a new mom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, I totally understand walking that kind of tight Absolutely. rope. Absolutely. Um, during your prenatal visits, did you find that your providers were kind of asking you the questions about your mental health or was it just a baby looks good, you look good, everything's fine? out the door, next patient in? What was your experience for your prenatal visits? Yes, so um, I had to always enter with my knapsack of advocacy, 
right? Yeah. So um, I had to actually bring in the information, okay? First and foremost, I'm a trauma survivor, okay? The same parts in which I survived trauma are the same parts that we're doing, that we will mm -hmm. be engaging in this birthing process. Mm -hmm. So I had to consistent, consistently remind providers of that. Um, I had to continuously, and also this is the thing, when birthing at teaching hospitals, um, the continuity of care is lacking in so many ways that you're possibly seeing a new student or new provider each time that you're there. That you're there. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to building that rapport and building that trust mm -hmm. and not having to dip into that advocacy net, like I, it was a, a restart each time, each, each appointment, okay, um, which got very tedious as I was also mm -hmm. high risk. So we, we know, you know, from lived experience, uh, what that monitoring is like. So having mm -hmm. to consistently remind of mm -hmm. what your needs are, what your presentation is, but then also to be believed. Okay. So believability is a big part of this, this conversation as well. Yeah. Did you feel like you were believed or did you feel like you spent a lot of your time convincing? It was 3000% convincing. Mm -hmm. Um, also having to legitimize what I was saying with my credentials and with my experience. And mm. I know for sure that there are individuals who will come into the medical space and never have to legitimize what the, what it is that they're saying. The believability is there. What they're saying is valid and it is accepted as, as truth. Um, so that's something that needs to be, that definitely needs to be addressed. Sure. Absolutely. You know, uh, Serena Williams shared her story with Vogue magazine and you would think this is Serena Williams. Everyone knows her name. She's on the global platform. She has millions of dollars and she's telling her doctor, do this. And the doctor is telling her no. So here we are, you know, people who don't have millions of dollars, nobody knows us. And, you know, we're educated, we're doing well, but we're still not believed and you still have to go in there and fight. I imagine that's not good for your mental health either consistently being in this hamster wheel of saying the same thing over and over again so the, the hamster wheel along with the gaslighting it, mm. it it felt deadly and suffocating to be to be quite mm. honest and transparent absolutely that makes absolute perfect sense to me jimmy i want to bring you in here because as someone who's standing on the outside in i assume that you had a new appreciation for how black women are treated in the medical field and the healthcare industry. I know with my situation, my husband said out loud, oh, when they say black women aren't listened to, that's what just happened. What did you see looking from the outside in? <laughs> um, you know, if I could take you to actually to the birth, just actually yeah. her giving birth. Um, we sat, uh, the birth was 36 hours. So the the time of the birth was 36 hours. So it was an extremely long period of time. And during that time, um, she she really advocated for herself. Lakia really spoke up volumes about what she needed mm -hmm. and what was done. And when the birthing time came, um, she actually had to direct the doctors and the nurses and everyone in the room to how to how to give birth, pretty much. I mean, she's mm -hmm. she's giving birth herself, and she's directing them on how to give birth. And um, there was some very there were some things that they didn't listen to prior that affected the birthing experience when my daughter was born. And um, I felt like if they had listened to her and listened to me as well during those time mm -hmm. during those periods of time prior to having having our daughter, it would have been a lot more successful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and even for me. Uh, before we had our daughter, I was in the hospital myself, and I really got to see how they responded to me um, while I was in the hospital, and then I got to see how they responded to her while she was giving birth. And it was a completely different experience. It, it was not. It was definitely not the same. Um, I can. I can't say you know there was favoritism or anything like that. It's just the way the way they catered to me and the way they catered to her was night and day. And mm -hmm. that's that's definitely one of the things that stuck out like a sore thumb um, during during that period of time. Mm -hmm. So, I imagine your wife had some some issues, you know, postpartum, especially going through that experience, and then the normal issues that come with after you know giving birth. Uh, from your perspective as a partner, 
what does it do to your mental health? I mean, this is a life change for you as well. Yeah. And then also seeing your wife go through this and the two of you enduring this together, what does it do for your mental health? How was your mental health affected? You know, um, it, it was definitely affected. Uh, I ended up with battles of depression, um, mm -hmm. anxiety. Um, you know, when you come from a black family, there's always the thing that you got to keep pushing, keep moving forward stay strong. Um, you know, you can do this. You're a strong black man. You have a strong black woman. Um, you know, the same slogans as they, as they, as we always know that they are. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I felt a lot of times that it was, it was hard to get up. Mm -hmm. Um, it was hard to, it was hard to, it was hard to care for our child knowing what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, and not being that, you know, being the parents that you are, you don't expect, to have to care for a child in the manner that we had to. Um, and our daughter was injured at birth, so it was a lot more that went into that um, postpartum than just depression and anxiety. I mean, we had a lot of therapy, we had a lot of mm -hmm. people that we had to see on a regular basis, um, early intervention. Um, there were so many things that we had to kind of navigate through just to really be settled, but we never really were settled, you know, we never really were we never really felt like what happened to us was right. right. Um, and we never felt like like our voices were heard. And even after mm -hmm. after we had her and brought her home, we still felt like our voices weren't heard. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something like, you know, it, it's, it's, it sticks with us, it sticks with us today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, 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 it can't say it weighs on us. You know, the healing process, I, it definitely, the healing process definitely is, is doing things of this nature, but it's also, mm -hmm. you know, trying to, find the brighter things that, mm -hmm. you know, having a child brings, you know, yeah. watching, watching her grow, watching her walk, watching her talk, seeing, mm -hmm. seeing how she just develops and into the beautiful child that she is. Um, and, you know, that's, that's been a blessing, but the, the mental health aspect has definitely been something that we've dealt with. Well, I want to thank you also for being vulnerable and sharing your story. Um, these are very personal feelings. Um, and, you know, I'm just, I'm so glad that you all feel safe enough to do so because I definitely think that it helps people who are listening and watching who might be going through the same thing and may not um, have it within them yet to speak up and speak out. Lakia, I want to ask you about your postpartum experience and the help that you received um, and the path to wellness. Did you, were you able to seek proper help for the depression, the anxiety and the trauma that you experienced? So that's also a very complex answer, right? Um, eight weeks postpartum, I, uh, I went to my doctoral program, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, as I was a part of um, entering into the medical community, um, I immediately asked when I got to campus, who is here that I can speak to, okay? Right. One of the things was that um, as both a mother and also a student, um, those things were not, um, it wasn't to, to say, very transparently, it wasn't welcomed. Okay, so it it it, it was incompatible in terms of in terms of um, that the particular institution that I was at. So um, the seriousness with which um, I was showing up, you know, every day, um, having panic attacks. Okay, mm -hmm. um, having um, great insomnia. Um, ruminating thoughts over the actual trauma um, that was happening. And then I'm sitting in classes and I'm learning best practices. I'm sitting in trainings and I'm learning about how to um, how to appropriately provide care as a part of the treatment team. And my lived experience and my academic experience is constantly um, in conflict. Yeah. Um, the other part to that is that um, as I'd already had PTSD due to um, recurrent, um, being a survivor of recurrent sexual trauma, um, this the 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 aftermath um just exacerbated all of that um symptomology and that's actually i want i was trying to be proactive and from the very first prenatal visit to avoid exactly where i was mm -hmm. um so concerning the, I, it was clear signs of ptsd depression um anxiety um yeah yeah mm -hmm. how are you now where are you in your journey to wellness now um, so I, I fir firstly, I have to say that returning to the field has helped to anchor me in, in wellness, particularly as I like to be a mirror for wellness mm -hmm. for those that I am helping along in the terms of their therapeutic journey. Um, two, it's taken a lot of 
very intentional work with practitioners who are both culturally informed as mm -hmm. well as informed about uh, Black birthing bodies and mm -hmm. uh, what the impact can be at the intersections and due to the disparities that we face. So um, actually being in, in sessions and being um, having individuals who are aware of that in my healing trajectory has really, really been helpful. Good. Glad to hear it. Jimmy, I want to ask you briefly, you mentioned that the emotional, mental experiences that you had uh, during your daughter's birth, they're still with you. And that's completely understandable and relatable. Day to day, how do you cope? How do you heal? Where are you on your path to wellness? Um, I'm still on my path, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I cope with doing things that that I find um, that help me, which is you know podcasting and um, having conversations with people about topics and um, creating. I find that that's something that's always helped me. Um, I'm in therapy myself as well for depression and anxiety. Um, but the, the one of the biggest aspects that have really helped me is to watch my daughter grow. Um, that's one of the biggest things that that's really helped. Um, just seeing her in school every day, uh, knowing how far she's come, um, mm -hmm. knowing what she went through and, and how she has developed into the person she is and the person she's going to be. It's, it's been that's been a very big help in healing. Um, we've had some some, you know, both of our children, we've we had some traumatic experiences, but seeing them relate to each other is, is, is what the, 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 the aspect of it that makes me feel very um, and there's hope in the future, you know, there's there's hope in, in healing, there's hope in, in knowing that that things can change. Um, and, you know, I hope that that our story in some aspects helps someone else out there. You know, they say you don't go through something just because you go through it. It's always sometimes to help someone else. And I felt like that's, you know, part of part of us, what we went through was to definitely be a, a vessel for someone else to, to relate to. Um, and that's, you know, that's been a blessing. That's definitely been a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'm particularly responding to both what Jimmy just shared and also what um, what Jen Davis shared in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of being an advocate for self, um, it's important to note that it was a two-year process between um, the actual traumatic birth and me finding a provider mm -hmm. uh, that I felt could um, could adequately uh, receive and help my healing trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes even in being an advocate, there are barriers that exist yeah. in a consistent advocate um, it's quite a draining process over a two year period, also managing um, depression and PTSD and otherwise to stick with that process. Mm -hmm. um, but for anyone listening who is there in this moment, as much as you can stick with the process because mm -hmm. you're worth it. And it may take some time. It took two years um, to begin that, that process with a, with a clinician, but um, do your best for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Lakia and Jimmy, again, I want to say thank you so much for being vulnerable enough, real enough to share your experiences. They are traumatic. I completely understand. And so I know the bravery it takes to stand up on this platform, share what you've been through, share where you are, and most importantly, let people who are watching know that they're not alone yeah. and they're not suffering in silence alone. We've all been there and there is hope on the other side. So thank you both so much for being here. I want to bring in uh, again, Dr. Karen Sheffield Abdullah, you know, Karen, so much to unpack in what the two of them shared with their stories, you know, between Lakia saying that she tried to get ahead of this and tried to prevent where she ended up being. And then on the outside, on the, on the flip side, on the other side, taking two years to finding a provider who understands her and listens to her. What's your takeaway from the stories you just heard? Let's unmute yourself so we can hear you. Thanks. Um, first of all, just wanting to acknowledge the bravery, the courage that it takes to have the conversation that Lakia and Jimmy just had acknowledge that what happened should not have happened. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge that black women need to be seen, heard and valued. The first time. Speak, 
believe them the first time, exactly. especially during pregnancy. Not, I mean, all pregnant women, when they tell me something doesn't feel right, I listen. Whether or not physiologically or the clinical diagnostic tests are telling me or confirming that, it does not matter. The woman knows, the birthing individual knows better than any of us, their own body and what is going on. And for somebody to come in with a history of trauma mm -hmm. and to state that history of trauma at the beginning of the pregnancy and to have to continue to advocate time and time again throughout prenatal visits across different providers is unacceptable. Absolutely. Just, I mean, from, from a provider standpoint, that's unacceptable. That yeah. needs to be talked about, that needs to be put in her chart so that she does not have to be re-traumatized every time and talk about it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. We need to be really cognizant and aware and sensitive about touch, about interaction with that individual when they have a history of trauma and have an open conversation about what the exams will look like, what, how might I best support and provide care for that individual, mm -hmm. what birth is going to look like, how mm -hmm. might I best you know, support what she wants her birth experience to be within the limits of safety. All those things are considerations and especially for black women. So mm -hmm. first of all, just wanting to acknowledge that um, and then bringing in the elements, you know, ACOG, the American College of Obstetric Technology recommends that there is um, mental health care screening that's done at least once in the pregnancy, at least that's once. That's it, just yeah. at least once in at the whole once. 40 weeks of someone at being pregnant? Once. At least once. Now there are, you know, this can be individualized depending on the setting that uh, an individual may be in. Some will say, well, we're gonna do it every trimester right? Mm -hmm. And then also postpartum. But for the most part, many are doing this Edinburgh postnatal depression scale, which is kind of the standard of care right. for um, providing that in the first trimester. There are not a lot of validated um, perinatal screening tools to look at mental health. I will also say depression gets a lot of um, attention, mm -hmm. but anxiety Mm -hmm. studies have shown is actually more prevalent than depression during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Up to 20% mm -hmm. of women will experience depression, uh, anxiety during pregnancy. So I really wanna highlight that aspect of the importance of having screeners that are also gonna pick up on anxiety, not just depression. Right. And there are modified scales. Uh, there's like a three item scale of the Edinburgh depression scale that can also pick up on anxiety. But I think it's something that as healthcare providers, we really need to lean into and become more comfortable navigating that conversation and what it might look like in this population. Like I said earlier, it's really mm -hmm. important to, um, in the studies that I've done, when I asked um, Black women, how would, how do, should we navigate conversations around stress and your psychological distress? They were like, if you want to know what I'm worried about, you want to know what I'm stressed about, ask me what I'm Googling. Oh. Right? Yes. What, what are they Googling? I know what I was Googling. I was right? Googling I intrusive thoughts and coming up with crazy scenarios, driving myself toward anxiety. What are they Googling? That's right. That's right. That's right. And so you will get at, so asking them, are you feeling anxious? Mm. You, they may not say, they may not right. identify as saying yes, or feel that they want to be that vulnerable because of the stigma that is associated, or they're afraid that, well, if I acknowledge this, then they're going to come and take my baby or, you know, whatever their concerns may be. So becoming aware of the unique ways that we can have these types of conversations. And that's, you know, part of the work that I am doing. And so really wanting to acknowledge the experience that um, Jimmy and Lakia had, and also just wanting to say the, the opportunities that I hear mm -hmm. that I believe were missed in their care mm -hmm. was that it didn't seem like they were connected with a mental health care provider throughout the pregnancy that would help navigate, help them navigate through what can arise during pregnancy in terms of worsening anxiety and depressive symptoms or worsening PTSD or anxious about what it, what the exam is going to be like or what the birth is going to be like. So really being able to connect Lakia early right. in the pregnancy. And some would say with a racially concordant mental health care provider. Yeah, you know, and that's uh, that's one of the sad things where we are in in our times today is 
a lot of black people typically lean toward other black providers, be it a dermatologist, an OBGYN, a pediatrician, just because we're looking for that connection where I don't have to explain to someone the racial weathering I'm going through because you're enduring it as well. Um, you talk about a lot of the missed opportunities. And that's something that I heard as well, especially from two people, both Jimmy and Lakia, who seem to be trying to get ahead of the game. Um, Jimmy said that his wife had everything planned out and wasn't listened to. And you mentioned before this continuity of care. At what point do you think the medical care industry needs to bring in mental health providers on these teams? At the beginning. At the very beginning, it needs to be, it's not, we all shouldn't be siloed in providing the care, mm -hmm. right? And that, you know, each person stays in their own respective space. At the beginning, ideally, within the healthcare system, there is going to be quality, right? Not just yeah. access. Yeah. Right. And Black right. women are clear about that. Right. Don't just refer me to any therapist and then they can't help me. They don't understand my issues. They don't take my insurance, whatever it may be. Right. Right. They need quality mental health care providers that can be there and understand their unique issues and be hooked in quickly, mm -hmm. right? And some may say that they have them on staff right mm -hmm. there in the office. Oh yeah. This is, you cannot have health without mental health. Mental health is a priority. And so we absolutely must make it a priority within the healthcare system. Yeah. Like I said before, we've done a really good job of disconnecting the top from the bottom Absolutely. and we got to put them back together again. Mind yeah. Mind connection. They go hand in hand. Yes. Um, okay. Last question for you because we're running out of time. Yes. And I asked this before, you know, as a provider, what would you tell women birthing people the checklist they should go through to check within themselves for their mental health and and then find a point to advocate and really push for that referral to a therapist? Yeah, so a couple of things came to mind as um, we talked a little bit about the importance of advocating for ourselves and, and when selecting a healthcare provider. And we can absolutely, just the way you gave the analogy of the hair salon, interview healthcare providers and see if they align with the type of care that you want to receive, right? Mm -hmm. So really taking the time, make the list of the different um, healthcare providers that are available, OBGYNs, midwives, whatever your preference may be, and then going in and interviewing with them to, you know, early in the pregnancy to see whether or not this is a, an office that you want to be with. You are a consumer. Mm -hmm. You absolutely mm -hmm. should be able to feel um, empowered to make that informed decision. And then also thinking about how am I feeling? Um, what is in my gut about what's going on with my health? Checking in um, with your partner or with friends or with family about the way that you're feeling, really recognizing the importance of thinking about anxiety, especially if you have a history thinking about history of anxiety, history of depression, increases your chances, right, of developing postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. So we definitely want to be thinking about not only whether or not I'm being screened, but also talking to your healthcare provider. Here's my history. And I think it's important that I be screened more than just once during the pregnancy, Yeah. right? And somebody had also mentioned doulas. Certainly the importance of um, doulas cannot be understated. And I think now in more mainstream media, we're hearing a lot more about doulas and they're getting mm -hmm. more attention about the importance that um, they play mm -hmm. in improving outcomes mm -hmm. for black birthing individuals, absolutely. But I also wanna just take a moment to mention thinking about mindfulness. So I'm a yes. mindfulness instructor as well. So I wanna just bring in potential solutions, ways in which we can think about taking care of ourself, mm -hmm. prioritizing our own self-care, right? And that that is not self-indulgent, but prioritizing mm -hmm. our own self-care and doing it in ways where, for instance, mindfulness has absolutely been shown to decrease anxiety symptoms, decrease depressive symptoms, decrease mm -hmm. stress, decrease pain, increase quality of life, increase mm -hmm. well-being. Mm -hmm. 
And so if we think about, and there are some studies that have looked at mindfulness within the perinatal population, within pregnant populations, there aren't as many, and this is my work, this is my, my research, in developing culturally tailored, trauma-sensitive, mm -hmm. patient-centered, mindfulness-based programs targeting stress and anxiety in Black women. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, hands down. That makes it relevant and have, have it resonate with Black women in a way that allows them to stay in the moment yeah. with what is here without judgment. And yeah. that's how when we are in tune with mind and body mm -hmm. we can advocate more for ourselves when we're, we find ourselves in a healthcare system that doesn't want to listen to us. Absolutely. Again, you just bring up so many points and it just makes me think of that superhero black woman perception um, where we're we doing it there. all. Yeah. Right. And then it's like, I want to get my nails done. Something simple. I want to have an hour with a glass of wine at the end of my day. And there's this like mommy guilt mm -hmm. or shame that happens. And I swear men don't experience it. I know for a fact my husband doesn't. Mm -hmm. But it's something that I think the mindfulness is yes. something that either it's not learned, it's not taught, it's not something that's emphasized. Or they just, you know, especially for the black community, they don't think it's accessible. They don't think it's for them. Right. We, we hear about the whiteness of wellness. Mindfulness has traditionally been thought some, of something that is more for majority culture. And so what I'm wanting to be able to do is advocate for how mindfulness can really work in prioritizing the self-care and allowing us to be in tune with our own mind-body connection that will then allow us to advocate for our own health and then be able to achieve mental health so that we can actually have true health. I know I'm eating into time here, but I just want to ask one last question so that we can really emphasize the mindfulness. When you're saying this, explain exactly what you mean. Are we talking about meditation? Are we talking about, you know, someone work really well with schedules, taking that hour before their day starts, the hour at the end of the day, just checking in? What do you mean when you say mindfulness? So mindfulness, right? So, and I'm, I'm trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction developed by John Kabat-Zinn over four decades ago. But mindfulness is about staying in the present moment, present moment awareness without judgment for whatever is arising in that moment. A lot of times with mental health con conditions, we're either worrying about the future or ruminating about the past. We are not staying in the present moment. And so with mindfulness, it's about bringing us to the present moment. And that can be through meditation. It can be through walking meditations, mindful movement, mm -hmm. yoga. Mm -hmm. It can include body skin, really grounding in the body with what are you feeling during pregnancy and in the postpartum period? What is felt in the body, mm -hmm. grounding in the body and doing that in a trauma informed and trauma sensitive way. So wanting to make sure that we're not further activating or traumatizing individuals, but really making sure that we're offering a potential opportunity that is non-medication, right? I'm not saying that we shouldn't do therapy or that medication doesn't have its place, but it's a non-medication way of thinking about how to prioritize our health and our well-being. Yeah. Dr. Sheffield Abdullah, I could talk to you forever. Yay. Thank you so much for sharing your, your insight and your expertise you. with us. I do want to bring in uh, next Dr. Kanika Harris, the Director of Maternal and Child Health at the Black Women's Health Imperative. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon and, and getting ready to share your expertise. You know, let's talk about policy surrounding specifically Black maternal care, which involves mental health care. Where are we lacking in policy? Thank you so much. You know, when I hear Lakia and Jimmy's story, it reminds me of a quote by Charles M. Blow. Um, One does not have to operate with great malice to do great harm. The mm -hmm. absence of empathy and understanding are sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're hearing. And that's, you know, what's happening right now. And the Black Women's Health Imperative is always about centering the lived experiences and informing our policy. And also making sure that the reason we have both Lakia and Jimmy here is because we don't, we're not here alone. And a lot of times when we're talking about maternal mental health or postpartum depression, it's like this woman that's just alone on this island and she's just out here by herself. And so I just wanted to put that in the center as well. You know. Lakia left the hospital barely intact. No one bothered to ask her 
how we can get you whole again, you know, beyond the physical therapy for her and her child. Um, you know, no one asked her about her mental health. And this is the state of our country right now. And so when I think about Dr. Sheffield's work as well, we need something now, something we can do right now, because this is happening over and over again. I just had a really difficult doctor's appointment where I was just like, wow, he never asked me about my lived experience or my stress. And it's really hard to be vigilant and advocate for yourself. And you really shouldn't have to, like that should just be a given. So in terms of black women's health imperative, um, we work extensively to elevate and support the Black Maternal Momnibus Act. So in that act, it's a suite of 12 proposed bills. Um, two of them specifically focus on maternal mental health. We have the Moms Matter Act that will provide community-based support for mothers with identified mental health or substance use disorders. And we also have the Kira Johnson's Act um, to provide resources for pregnant people experiencing mental health conditions and substance abuse issues. And I would also like to highlight the MAMA Act um, that will require all states to extend Medicaid coverage for one year postpartum. Um, as Jen Davis de described, you know, we're postpartum for at least a year. I say we're postpartum for the rest of our life. Yeah. But um, at least let's talk about the first year. Um, there's also legislation through the Maternal Mortality Review Committees to standardize data collection and reporting and also to improve access to culturally congruent and competent care and incentivize doula support, as Dr. Sheffield mentioned. Um, BWHI has also supported Into the Light Bill that's led by the Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance to advocate advocate for maternal mental health hotlines in real time 24 seven mm -hmm. with culturally and linguistically congruent therapists, counselors or peer supporters, um, also with available texting options. Additionally, as we're thinking about these, um, these screenings and these scales, uh, how are you trained to give these screenings and scales and disseminate the information and do follow up with cultural humility? Um, so that's also a part of that bill that we support. And currently through funding from the Kellogg Foundation, BWHI is working in the South to understand maternal mental health needs from birthing families and, and also providers and to better design and inform screening tools, but also look at the best approaches at getting at this information beyond screening um, as Dr. Sheffield got it earlier. Um, sometimes it's about how you ask the questions, what ways you ask the questions. Are screening always going to be the most appropriate way? And how do we understand and get at that information? Mm -hmm. So that's what BWHI is doing right now. And then also a part of the way forward for this um, is centering the story for Lakia and Jimmy and providing that foundation to amplify them um, for all of you to hear them on this call and to act. Um, and give them the opportunity to stand up and you know reclaim that power through mm -hmm. this vehicle in this space. Mm -hmm. Before I let you go, Dr. Harris, I want to ask you know in the work that you're doing, um, you all are just pounding the pavement out there. Are you finding that you know this is a time, a peak moment in time where providers, universities, um, patients, uh, lawmakers are really interested in improving care for Black women and Black birthing people? Yes. I mean, we have to seize the moment. This is our time. For the first time, um, we're centering doulas in a way that we never have before. I think everybody knows, well, maybe not everybody, but, and just to clarify, doulas are non-clinical support people um, that are trained to help you emotionally, physically, um, tangible support, connect you to resources after, you know, pregnancy. We have full spectrum doulas now that work from, um, from conception through, you know, if you experience a loss, birth doulas and postpartum doulas. So now we are working to, I've been on several calls this week, just working on, um, getting Medicaid to support doulas, um, mm -hmm. midwives. We know midwives, um, have the best, most um, scientifically appropriate care in terms of how we should be treated 
And we find more that um, we need to listen to midwives and let them lead the way. They are also getting attention right now. So I think, yes, and we have to seize this moment right now. Absolutely. Dr. Harris, thank you so much for your time and explaining the policy and the work that you all are doing. It's important work. It's vital work to the community and to this path forward to mental wellness. Uh, we do have quite a few questions that I want to get to um, before this webinar comes to an end. Uh, our first question from an audience member is, how do we find opportunities for screening after the six week visit. I'm a clinical psych trainee and I often see patients present with more mood and anxiety symptoms after the six week point. I find this question layered um, and interesting because I know a lot of women will have a baby and go back to a job after six weeks, which is absolutely insane and a travesty in the wealthiest nation in the world allegedly. Um, so, uh, you know, who can who can take this question for us in terms of finding opportunities for screening after the six week visit? Well, I can I can speak from the healthcare provider perspective. It is true that it seems like all of a sudden, once the birthing individual reaches the six week appointment, they no longer like exist, right? Yeah. Like they just fall off the radar from at least the OB standpoint, uh, standpoint, excuse me. And so I think it's really important that if we're doing the screening mm -hmm. prenatally and mm -hmm. again at that six week visit, that that is a key time to be able to then connect that person to the necessary resources so that they are now hooked in with whatever provider is going to best serve them moving forward, right? And, and to be perfectly honest, in, in practice, in addition to, as a nurse midwife, in addition to doing prenatal care, I see patients across the lifespan, right? From pregnancy, puberty, all the way to menopause. And so I can actually see that individual after the six week appointment, and I can do some management, right? Mm -hmm. Of their mental health care concerns. And I can prescribe, I can then, you know, get them hooked in. And then if I feel like they would also benefit now, maybe they need polypharmacy, they need more than one medication, or I'm feeling that it's necessary for therapy, then I can then, you know, connect them in. But the idea is that they don't get lost to follow up at that six week visit, or furthermore, lost to follow up after they deliver. Many birthing individuals don't even show up for the six week appointment. Mm. Right. So we need to be doing more while they're in the hospital prior to discharge. Let's yeah. have a plan of care for this individual so that they're not lost to follow up. Yeah. Right. It, right. Absolutely. Um, our next question, is there a possibility that there'd be better maternal health outcomes if training started from college in terms of incorporating this subject matter into the curriculum and the internships. And I can say I've worked with uh, two organizations here in DC, the Community of Hope organization in Ward 7, as well as a George Washington Hospital, um, two black women there who are leading the charge in training their residents to be empathetic and understanding. One of the doctors said, and this is an OBGYN, she said that uh, she walked in amongst her peers and they thought that she was uh, like a janitor. Uh, so she knew then that there is work to be done in terms of how black women are perceived. So, you know, Dr. Sheffield Abdullah, where where does the training start? Is this on the job training that we have right now or, or what, what situation are we in? Oh, there's so many opportunities to be able to do. Um, absolutely have there be training for medical students, right? Mm -hmm. Pre-med, medical students, residents, fellows, physicians, attendings across the span, because we can't just assume that just because somebody is an attending physician, that they actually have the knowledge base, right, for how to take care of this particular population. There are studies that are out there that truly, the perinatal population who are dealing with mental health conditions or concerns, it's a unique population because most of the OB say, oh, well, you have a mental health concern, so I need to refer you to the therapist or the psychologist, right? And then the psychologist is like, oh, you're pregnant. So we need to send you back to the to OB. And they're in this nebulous space of where do we land? And, and so I think if we start having these conversations, 
with medical students who quite honestly don't know how to navigate these conversations, right? right? So I think in answer to that question, absolutely starting at the collegiate level, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And starting to have these conversations about health disparities, social contributors to health, right. and also thinking about birth equity, thinking about what's happening for black birthing individuals in particular, mm -hmm. and being trauma informed and trauma sensitive and understanding the lived experience, understanding the historical nature of medical racism and how it is informed what where we are today. Yeah. And busting that that bias that we all have, whether you want to admit it or not. Dr. Harris, will you chime in on this in terms of the training for um, this sensitivity and when it should yeah. start? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Black Women's Health Imperative is starting a doula training program for in college for historically black colleges. Um, and that's and that's the thought of out of that comes that this has to be a part of our culture. Not only do we have the resources, but and we're changing things around policy, but if we don't change things around policy, um, in order to act on the policies and have those resources, we have to change the culture around care. And that has to start earlier. And so training college students to become doulas, they get to learn how to advocate for themselves. They get to learn preconception care. They get to learn all those things. For some reason, you don't learn about pregnancy and postpartum until you are pregnant, which is such a huge miss, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like this closed door until, oh, I'm pregnant. It's positive. Now I should learn about pregnancy. And by that time, we're too late. And so how do we start this earlier? How do we start the conversation earlier? But also, um, how do we change the idea around culture of care? What to expect when I'm pregnant? What to expect when I'm postpartum? Mm -hmm. So, and then also, we don't have any midwife, midwifery programs on historically Black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. So to open that door and start advocating, if we know this is, you know, optimal care we can provide, then... You need, we, we need to have safe spaces so that we're turning out our own midwives mm -hmm. to provide um, this culturally congruent care that we're talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, it's kind of like, come on, <laughs> what are we doing here? Yeah. And so that's, you know, BWHI is trying to lead the charge to start these conversations. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think those conversations are starting to happen yeah. and recognizing that that is something that should be a priority as we think about racially congruent care between provider, women's health care provider, and, and patient. And I will also just say, nurse midwives have been around since biblical times. Oh, yeah. Right? And oh, to be perfectly honest, it is not rocket science. Our, our um, outcomes have been clear mm -hmm. for decades yeah. that we improve birth outcomes. And so why there is this continued resistance to really incorporating midwives in more of an integral way into the, the birthing system um, to further improve outcomes. I, I, I'm not quite sure, but that's something that I think could be advocated for within policy. Absolutely. I just want to chime in here because you talk about racially congruent care and it's key. And we do know the outcomes are better when you look like your provider, which is a sad thing to say, but it's simply the truth. The only problem I have with it is I had a black OBGYN. My son came early he was an emergency C-section and my doctor did not look like me. And I had the experience that was completely opposite of my daughter who her doctor, my doctor then looked like me. So I, I believe in this training um, at PWCs, at HBCUs early, early, early because not everyone has the access. You know, in the DMV, you can find a black doctor in any field, no problem but not everyone has that luxury of living in a place where they have access to a provider that looks like them. So this, this training has got to be, got to be early um, and, and necessary. Um, okay. Let's, let's move on. Cause I, I'm running out of time here. Um, okay. My question for the panelists is how we can create a bigger community of support, especially including more supportive employers, workplaces, and academic institutions. Jen, I'm gonna bring you in here uh, for this because we were talking about the black community, how we're not so supportive of each other all the time. Um, yes, thank you. So I think 
I think it's about us being comfortable having these conversations. Um, and and especially as women who have gone through it, you know, not feeling like we have to hold this in and just navigate it ourselves. And like, I can't talk to anyone. I just have to deal with it. We have to become comfortable with this and understanding that it's okay for us to go seek help. It's okay for us to push back if we're not receiving what we need from a provider. It's okay for us to search. It's okay. And it's unfortunate if the Black provider we have isn't giving us what we need and we need to continue to search for another one. We have to find what is going to work for us. We have to become comfortable in the Black community um, talking about mental health, whether it's perinatal mental health or mental health in general. We have to become comfortable seeking exactly what we need. And sometimes, you know, that can look like support groups. That can look like, you know, connecting with an expert. That can look like peers, peer mentors. So I'm thinking about some of the offerings that we have at Postpartum Support International. We have peer mentors where you can connect with another Black woman or however you identify to just have that you know, have that relationship with someone who has gone through the same thing. We have mm -hmm. online support groups. So this touches on a question around what else is out there if you don't want medication or you don't have, you know, the finances to pay for certain things. We have online free support groups that, um, that are specific to how you identify. We have chats with experts. We have peer mentors. We have support coordinators within each state that even specialize in the PMAD that you might be experiencing. So I think there are supports that are out there that can be free of cost, but it comes down to us being able to have these honest, transparent conversations mm -hmm. around what we're feeling, what we are experiencing, and then finding exactly what we need whether that's mindfulness, whether that's a different provider in order to help us address that. Um, and I think so many of us right now have gone through this and, and there's so much that if I went back, I would have done differently. I don't right now where I am, I don't think I'm having another child, but if I, <laughs> if I knew then what I know now, yeah. I feel like my experience would have, would have been so much different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jimmy, this next question is for you, um, I'm a women's health care nurse practitioner. How can we as providers do a better job in including partners when during the pandemic, my office policy doesn't allow visitors to accompany patients? You know, you're a partner. Let's say you're in a situation where you can't be there at every doctor's appointment and you know what your wife is going through. What would you want providers to do to help you be there and be part of this? Um, I would say keep the partner uh, more abreast to what's going on, more more in tune. Um, keep them open to including them into the the appointment, including them into you know what was what has been going on with within the pregnancy, um, what to expect afterwards as the partner. Um, I was so blindsided by everything. I'm like, what? You know, like what what is going on? And coming home and trying to navigate that just. I'm not, I'm not Googling anything. I'm just looking and say, okay, well, this is the best thing I can do. I think if I had some advice prior to, if I had some, some tutelage on how to handle certain aspects of it, I think I would, I it would have benefited so much more. It would have benefited me and benefited my wife as well. And I think, you know, overall, they just expect the partner just to be, you know, you're supposed to be the partner, just support. But if you don't know how to support, how can you support? Um, and that was one of the biggest aspects for me that was, that was kind of lacking. Um, I told even told Kanika when we first had the conversation about it was I didn't I was so unaware of what to expect that I felt like I was I was failing, you know, mm. and um, in a large aspects, I, I wasn't, but I felt like I was. And, you know, I think having having someone be able to help me through the process while they're helping my wife through the process as well would have been very beneficial in, in every aspect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can I add that, can we Absolutely. not be partners as visitors? Like I, when I just read that question, I was like, wait a second. The partner is not the visitor. The partner is a partner and in, in, in a stakeholder in the pregnancy. Yeah. They sh the dyad, the two should be included. I mean, Dr. Karen, I, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I noticed that was very prevalent was they they didn't believe what we said a lot about our relationship even um mm -hmm. you know they didn't believe that we were married they didn't believe that that you know you know in the black community is baby daddy baby mama that that's what they 
figure we are. And, you know, we were married before we had children because that's just what our belief was. And that we, you know, that was important to us. So when we walked in, you, we, you might not look like we're a married couple as quote unquote, whatever it is, but we are. And we expect to be treated that way, but we weren't. And, um, you know, that was something that definitely stood out so much. I mean, it's just, it, it, it pains me to this day to remember that, you know, we had to convince them that, oh no, we are married. I am the husband, this is my wife. You know, you want me to go get the marriage certificates? You want me to pull up online so you can see our names on the certificates? You know, that was kind of how we felt about it. So yes, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. So I also just wanted to add to you that, um, you know, um, marriage should not also should not be a precursor to treatment or to um, quality care, to quality care, continuity of care or other. Yeah, ways. Um, it has no bearing on what that experience at all in any way, shape or form for sure. at all. You know, and that's what I, I would say. I mean, it just goes back to if I didn't go to college, I deserve quality care. If my skin is brown, I deserve quality care. If I don't have millions of dollars, I deserve quality care. It's just all of these stereotypes and people's bias get in the way of your promise as a provider to take care of me, all of me, top to bottom, mental, physical me. And it's so sad. And it's discouraging that the statistics show and that we know that the outcomes are even worse for black and brown people for no other reason than they are black and brown. Right. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of obstacles that we have to overcome. But I want to say thank you all so much for being here for sharing that expertise, for sharing your insight, your perspectives. There's so much to learn. The first step is, of course, the awareness. Um, and that's what I love about the Black Women's Health Imperative is from awareness to advocacy, you guys cover the gamut. And it's great and it's hard work, but it's good work and it has to be done and it benefits all of us. So Dr. Harris, Jen Davis, Jimmy, Dr. Karen, Lakia, uh, Dr. Reeves, thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of this and thank you for hosting this. We couldn't get to all of the questions because this is such um, a thorough topic and we ran out of time, um, but always follow Black Women's Health Imperative on social media. They're hosting events like this all the time. And it's great to have you all joining us and taking part in this. Um, on behalf of everyone here, thank you again. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.